Welcome back to Music 239, Introduction to World Music. I have a question for you based on yesterday's discussion. Are vocables really meaningless, nonsense syllables? No. Someone says no. Okay, remember what vocables are? They're the third on our list of characteristics of Native American music. And we talked about them a little bit yesterday, and I described them at one point as nonsense syllables. In the book it says meaningless, okay? But somebody says no. Why not? Why are they not meaningless? Okay, so it depends on the culture and who's listening. Any other answers to that? Yes. So the fact that the syllables don't have an actual meaning in the language doesn't mean that they are nonsense or meaningless syllables to the person that is singing them. And in fact, particularly one of the pieces that we're going to study today, the Yebiche, uh, you're going to find that uh, the, 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 the vocables that are happening there are cries out to the gods, and so extremely meaningful. Uh, as, as far as the syllables go. So an important point that I wanted to start with today. Okay, now, we left off in our last session with discussions of the Navajo culture, way of life. Okay, we discovered that uh, they uh, have a very large reservation in parts of Arizona, Utah, New Mexico, and that they have uh, sources of livelihood from a variety of places, including the U.S. government, Department of Interior, that helps to subsidize them based on treaties signed in the 19th century. The Navajo are also, as your text points out, very creative people. Uh, the silversmithing and the uh, various kinds of weaving and art that they do, in addition to the music, tend to be highly creative. Their language is extremely complicated. Has so anybody here ever heard of Navajo code talkers? Yes. Yes. What was that about? Uh, didn't they use them in the war as uh, like secret ways to do that the uh, enemies can understand them? Which war? World War II. World War II. It's the Japanese. Yes. Particularly the Japanese because the Navajo language was so difficult to decipher that they could use that to send messages to the troops uh, and the Japanese could not uh, decipher what the language was or, or have anybody that could figure it out. And so the Navajo Code Talkers was a very important chapter in the U.S. military history during World War II. Very complicated, sophisticated language. Uh, and the creativity factor is one that will bear on some of the songs that we're going to hear today, uh, both in today's session and in the next session. Let's move on to talk then about uh, some of their costumes. Your text talks about uh, some of the outfits that they wear. Okay, your text talks about the fact that the, uh, some of the women wear skirts that are based on what the U.S. Army post uh, wives were wearing in the 19th century when they were first taken onto the reservation into, uh, into the forts in the U.S. Army. Houses, you see a list of them there. And also ceremonial buildings, domed structures that are designed to represent miniature versions of the earth with the sky and the earth below uh, for some of the ceremonies that we are going to be looking at today. Now, uh, the first thing we're going to do during this session is to study three ceremonial pieces of music that are on your CD. Anybody uh, notice all of the ceremonies in the text having to do with Navajo way of life? Uh, can anybody name some of the ceremonies? The night way ceremony. The night way ceremony is one of them. Mm -hmm. And what is the night way ceremony about? Purification. Okay, purification and healing, isn't it? Okay. What about the next one that you see up on the top here? The song uh, and and uh, song Shizana'e. What ceremony is that from? Enemy way. 
Okay, what is enemy way about? Uh, yes, yes, it used to be, I think, originally preparing for war, but in, in later days, uh, it is more about people who have returned from war trying to prepare them to return to the tribe after they have been off and perhaps had to kill people in conflict, allow them to return to tribal life. Uh, an enemy way ceremony might be performed there. Shooting way is a third ceremony that we're going to look at today. And that one has more to do with uh, uh, things like snake bites and uh, people that uh, have uh, had bad relations with snakes will often have a, a, a shooting way ceremony performed in order to uh, make peace between the people and the snake people that caused the snake bite to occur in the first place, according to Native American myth. So uh, a lot of this ties in with mythical beliefs and with religion, but there is some uh, psychological kinds of benefits as well. All of these are healing rituals in one way or another. And your book refers to other rituals as well, such as Mountain Way, uh, another healing ritual. All of these are various kinds of rituals that help with the healing process. Uh, the Navajo certainly take advantage of modern medicine, antibiotics, hospitals, blood transfusions, they do all of that stuff. But in addition to that, they maintain their traditional beliefs that healing can occur from within through the use of ceremonial practices such as enemy way and night way. So that's, that's where, what we're going to be looking at in these three pieces. The three compositions, the Yebiche, the song Shizana'e, and the Navajo Sacred Prayer are associated with the three, the three ceremonies that you see listed. So let's look at each of these now in some detail. Starting with the Yebiche song from the Nightway Ceremony. Yebiche literally translated as gods of their grandfathers. And it is a long, long ritual lasting several days. <coughs> Masked dancers impersonating the gods. It goes on for about seven days and nights uh, and, and, and often goes all night for some of these rituals. Uh, quite a long ceremony. Uh, as your book points out, it is a uh, uh, reminiscent of a Wagnerian opera in terms of the length and in terms of the involvement of what's going on with this ritual. Okay, so they're trying to bring supernatural power to help the sick person. The Yebiche uh, is, uh, is on your CD, okay, uh, and uh, you'll find it on uh, track six. Transcription of the Yebiche is located in your book. Okay, so you should find a Yebiche transcription. Why don't you turn there at this time and take a look at that? And we will listen to just a little bit of, of the Yebiche song. Everybody find the transcription in the book? Okay. Um, now, let's do what we did yesterday and go back and look at some of the characteristics of Native American music and see how many of those we can identify here in the Yebiche. How about monophonic singing? Any of that? 
Sure, single vocal line, uh-huh, sung by an individual or by a group. Yeah, monophonic singing. Singing in octaves, we have any of that in this one? Mm, I'm not sure I heard that in this one. We can listen to it again, Andy, and, and, and see if we can hear that singing in octaves, but I'm not sure I heard that here. What about vocables? Now, for that, you're going to have to look at the transcription and look at the text in there. Are there vocables here? Yeah. He, 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 ho, 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 he, 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 okay, those are vocables. See those down there? Those don't mean anything in the language, but this is the situation where the vocables are the cries to the gods, to the supernatural, to try to bring healing, and so they are far from meaningless, right? So, okay, so we do have vocables in this one. Repetition? Yes, you bet. Uh -huh. Falsetto? Yes. yes, we've got lots of falsetto with the male voices up above in the head voice. Mm -hmm. Pulsations on long notes? Yes. yes. Now in the transcriptions, you will see sometimes double dots over a note if there's going to be pulsations. I'm not sure that we have quite as much of a pulsation effect in this piece because there really aren't as many long notes as there are in others. Go listen to it again in a minute and check that out. We'll check out the pulsations and uh, we'll check out the octave singing, see if, we, uh, see if we can identify that. What else? Pentatonic scale? Sure, yeah, you look at, the, uh, look at the notes that are transcribed here in your transcription and it certainly fits that pentatonic scale pattern of minor thirds, major seconds. Mm -hmm. You bet. What else? Descending small note collections. There they are again. Yeah, every song we saw yesterday had those descending small note collections and here we have them too. Accompanied by percussion instruments? Yes. yes. Percussion and vocals not necessarily together? No, I think they are together in this piece. Yeah, I think in this case, yeah, you're right. The, 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 the actual uh, per percussion instruments that you're hearing are together metrically with the voices. Let's go back and listen again and see if we identify any of those octaves or the pulsations. <laughs> What do you think? Probably more vibrato. Yeah, not really the pulsation effect that we heard, for example, on the Zuni lullaby yesterday, where it was so clear that she was doing that. Okay, Andy, what do you think about the octave thing? Uh, there's not. I mean, like there's the E to C sharp that on uh, the E ho ho and yeah. then it jumps up to the re E. Yeah. Not yeah. There's not really two octaves going on at the same time. And we heard that in some of the songs yesterday, uh, but uh, in this, in the Yebeche, you really don't have that octave singing kind of thing, so that, I don't think that one is happening. Okay, so you're saying that they have to be on top of each other. Exactly. Parallel octaves. Mm -hmm. That's the Yebeche song. Now, let's move on and look at the Shizane-e from the Enemy Way ceremony. <coughs> the one thing I would like to point out about it before we move on, though, is down here at the bottom, the singer memorizes every detail of this multi-day ceremony, considered an intellectual and ceremonial leader in the community. Now, compare that to the way singers are, for example, in our culture. Are singers, particularly pop singers, are they considered intellectual leaders of the community? <laughs> Not necessarily. Sometimes they are. There's some notable exceptions. But, but in general, people who are musicians and singers are not considered 
the intellectual and ceremonial leader of the community as this culture has. So it's an interesting contrast that you can make between another culture and the one in which you live. Now looking at the circle dance song, Shizane A, okay, this is a completely different kind of song because while it is in another one of those healing rituals, the lyrics are anything but cries to the gods. Take a look at your transcription of Shizana A in your books and look at the translation. I'm in luck, I'm in luck. She's leaning up against the storefront looking everywhere for me. What's humorous about this in this culture? Yeah, because she is lying against a storefront, this implies that she's drunk. And what else does it imply? The woman's chasing the man. Right. right. The women are getting drunk and chasing after the men. <laughs> That's what's funny about it, because it's actually the exact opposite of what actually happens in the culture. Right? So... Uh, so in this situation, you're looking at a, a, a humorous song that is being used as part of a healing ritual. Let's listen to this song and see if we can identify the same kinds of characteristics that we did in the Yebiche. This is track eight. Hey, hey, Now, go back to your characteristics. Okay, you should have those by now. I'm not going to uh, flash back to them, but you should have those in your notes by now. Help me out. What characteristics do we see here in this song? I'm sorry? Monophonic. Monophonic. Absolutely. What else? Okay, where, where are vocables used? Mm hmm. Right, exactly. Okay. So the entire first part of it, which you could think of it as possibly as the chorus of the song, if you were to think of it in pop song terminology, you have like a chorus and a verse. The chorus is sung entirely in vocables, and then the verse goes into the actual <laughs> text. I'm in luck, I'm in luck. Right, okay, so we do have vocables here. What else? Repetition, Repetition absolutely. Mm -hmm. Repetition, good. What else? Falsetto? Falsetto? You think so? Uh, let's listen to it again. I think it might be. It's, it's a little harder to tell on this one. Let's, let's hold that one in reserve and come back and listen to it again and see uh, whether we uh, have really got falsetto here. What else? Pulsations. Pulsations. Absolutely. On the long notes in this case, yeah. And, and there's a lot of opportunities for pulsations because there are a lot more long notes if you look at the transcription in this piece than there were in the Yebiche. Okay. What else? Descending small note collections mm -hmm. and pentatonic scale. It's ubiquitous. You can probably put pentatonic for any Native American piece and have it right. There's a, there's a little tip for the test, right? Um, what else? Percussion? No. No percussion in this piece. So the last two categories do not apply in this case. 
Now, uh, let's go back and look at that question about falsetto. <laughs> What do we think? Falsetto? On that first note? It's pretty high. I think I would have to use falsetto to get that note. Right? Oh, way up there. I'd have to do it. So I think you could probably put falsetto and not get that marked wrong on the test. Uh, there are some places that could go either way. So I, I would definitely give credit for that in this situation. Okay, so doing a comparison then between the Yebeche and the Shizane A songs that we just heard, you can look at all of those characteristics and see, okay, which ones are characteristic of both songs and which ones are characteristic of only one or the other. The fact that they are completely different in nature uh, is really secondary because if you take these characteristics and you measure each song very objectively by each one, you can do a comparison and contrast of the songs uh, in a very efficient kind of way. And that's the kind of thing that we'll be doing throughout this course. The third song that we have in this collection of ceremonial songs is from the Shooting Way ceremony. And you will find a transcription of that in your text as well. Actually, uh, let me revise that. You don't find a musical transcription, but you do find a transcription of the text. And what is Shooting Way about? Yeah, you'll find a description of this in the book. What, what's it about? Making peace with the snake people. Ah, making peace with the snake people after a snake bite. Now that's not the only use of this song, but that is an example that the book gave as a, uh, as a possibility okay, of how this song might be used. Restoration of harmony between the people and the elements, essentially. And the recording in this case is not the best. I think it was probably recorded with an old cassette that uh, kind of starts fading in and out. If you've, if you've ever uh, experienced an old cassette tape that has places that fade in and fade out and uh, don't really sound with the same kind of fidelity, I think this recording has that problem. But it's a priceless recording and you can't get it anywhere else because you can't record these people anymore. So they included it in your collection anyway. Navajo Sacred Prayer is the name of the song. And this is a very interesting piece because when we have our, uh, our, our demonstration in a couple of days by Randy Falcon, he will tell you the same kind of thing, that there are certain pieces of music that he is not allowed to perform or doesn't feel comfortable performing for a public group because they are sacred pieces of music that are designed specifically for that ritual or for that particular religious ceremony and thus should not be sung in public. And any reason why? Did you read in the text why they may not want to perform those in public? It loses its effect. Ah, yes, it loses its effect. It's like it loses its potency if you sing it for somebody else. You have to reserve it for the ceremony. So this is one of those songs and so it's really quite rare that the person that recorded it was able to get the singer to actually do it. Obviously this singer did not feel that it was um, the kind of song that, that should not be sung for others, but there are other people who do feel that way and out of respect for those people, the author of the book didn't include the whole recording, just part of it. Let's listen to a bit of the Navajo sacred prayer from Shooting Way. That's track nine on CD number one. Oh, <laughs> 
looking at the text transcription, I have been searching everywhere over the earth. That is what I was told to do. I have been searching everywhere over the earth. I have been searching everywhere over the mountains. That is what I was told to do. I have been searching everywhere over the mountains. I have been searching everywhere under the sun. That is what I was told to do. I have been searching everywhere under the sun, and so on. Okay. What can you say about this music in this text in relation to the characteristics that we've been discussing? Yes? Well, the whole point of the shooting way is to restore um, the people with nature, and it talks, the text talks about the earth, all the elements that nature presents, the earth, the mountains, mm -hmm. you know, the sun, and fire, and water. Mm -hmm. Okay. So certainly the text leads you to believe that this is what this is trying to do in terms of bringing you back into concert with nature, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. What about the characteristics of Native American vocal music? How many of those do we see here? You need to go back and look at those. Is there percussion? Uh huh. So we have rattles accompanying us. Uh huh. Yeah. Certainly repetition. You see the repetition in the text. You see how repetition is used in the text to emphasize the whole point, where the structure is essentially the same and they simply change the element each time. So they start with searching everywhere over the earth. Second verse, searching everywhere over the mountains. Second ver third verse, searching everywhere under the sun. Fourth verse, searching everywhere for the fire. And so they're going to mention all of those elements within the same framework in a repetitious kind of format. That concept of repetition is one that you're going to see in a lot of world cultures, particularly when we get to uh, cultures of Asian countries, such as India, Japan, China. Here we see it in a Native American context in a very interesting way. So yes, repetition is extremely important here. What elements uh, do you also see from this list? I thought I heard octaves, I'm not sure though. Octaves? Okay, let's, let's go back and check that out in a minute. It's a little hard to hear the recording because of the uh, issues with the recording quality. So it might be a difficult one to transcribe. What else? Would it be monophonic? Monophonic, certainly, yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I'm glad you noticed that. Uh, remember yesterday, in yesterday's session, I talked about how call and response uh, was something that we saw in one of the songs, the Iroquois Quiver Dance. Here, there is a call and response with a leader who sings the phrase and then the singers who sing the phrase back. So, uh, very good. That's something we're going to see a lot more in African music, but here's another example in Native American of this principle. Good. What about vocables? I'm sorry? We can't really know because we don't know. Hard to tell, isn't it? Yeah, hard to tell. And they don't do a transcription for us here, so it's hard for us to tell whether these are vocables or whether, in fact, the text is what's being sung throughout the whole thing. So that one has to, I think, remain a question mark. Mm -hmm. Repetition we already discussed. What about falsetto? None of that in this piece, is there? No. Okay. Pulsations on long notes? I think so, but it does stuff with pulsations. Yes, yes. It, it, it's hard to tell, but I, I think there is pulsation there. And again, it's hard to tell because of the recording quality and because you've got call and response going on. It makes it extremely complicated. Uh, but I think that you could probably argue successfully for pulsations on this piece. What about uh, pentatonic scale? I think you probably could get away with it. <laughs> like I said, I think you could probably put pentatonic on every one of these. Descending small note collections? Yes. Sure. Accompanied by percussion? Yes, we established that. The rattles are there. Are, are they together? Yes. 
Are the rattles together with the, uh, with the singers? They seem to be at first, but the, as it goes to the music, they seem to almost get off at the time where the rattles are doing their own thing and mm. the singers are doing their thing. Okay. So it doesn't seem to match up exactly the way it did in the beginning. So the rattles and the voices start together, but as they go on, they're no longer synchronized as if the synchronization of the, the percussion with the voices is not an important priority for the Native Americans. Let's, let's listen to that again. Let's listen for those octaves, and let's also listen for the issue of the percussion staying together with the voices. Well, I think you're right. I think there might be occasional octaves chiming in from, uh, from some higher voices there. I, I heard that this time. Uh, and uh, Laurie, I don't know. The, the, um, the, the percussion thing is really hard to tell because of the recording quality. So we may have to, may have to put a question mark on that one. But uh, if you wrote those kinds of things on a test, I, I would certainly give you credit for them where there was any kind of question. Okay. Okay. So we've seen three different pieces here, and we've seen how to uh, make comparisons and contrasts between them using this list of characteristics. I'd also like to make you aware of the fact that there are other healing ceremonies that your book refers to, including the Blessing Way, the Mountain Way, and the Ghost Way. <clears throat> Those are just three of the other healing ceremonies to which the book refers that are not actually uh, included in the book as far as music goes. So we don't have musical examples for those, but those are also perfectly viable ceremonies. Did anybody read over the uh, portion of the biography of Frank Mitchell in the book, the Navajo singer? If you have not done that already, Please take the time to read that over. It is a fascinating excerpt, and it's really only a, a small excerpt of something that is uh, about 250 pages long, where he tells his life story. Uh, a fascinating kind of uh, insight into the life of a Navajo music maker. So I, I urge you to do that. Okay, uh, now in our next session, we're going to be looking at the hymn of the Native American church, and we're actually going to be doing a performance of that song. Okay? Uh, I'd like to actually look at that song first and talk a little bit about uh, what makes it work. Okay? And then in our next session, we are going to spend some time making the, uh, the instruments involved in this performance. We're going to make a water drum. Somebody's going to play it. Okay, I'm going to be looking for volunteers to make and play a water drum. Somebody else is going to play the rattle. For right now, I want you to turn to the transcription of the hymn of the Native American Church. It's also known as the Navajo Peyote Song. <clears throat> what is that all about? It's a cactus, isn't it? Yeah. Isn't it, um, doesn't it have like, certain <clears throat> properties about it similar to drugs? Uh, yes, it does. It is actually a uh, hallucinogen. Okay? And if you take the peyote cactus and dry it, cut it into small pieces, uh, and then uh, basically chew on it, uh, you can create uh, hallucinogenic effects. And uh, this is used in what is known as the Native American church for uh, contact with the supernatural. Now, the U.S. government didn't see it that way at a certain time, 
and they, uh, they had some, uh, some difficulties with the way that the practitioners of this peyote church were doing things and actually tried to stamp it out. But uh, ultimately, I think the Native Americans won their case in indicating that this was a religious practice, and so freedom of religion held court in the Bill of Rights so that they were allowed to do it. It's a very interesting series of court cases that you might look at if you have an interest in this area. The song that we have here, the Hymn of the Native American Church, is a song that is used as part of the uh, ceremony uh, having to do with the, the peyote cactus. Okay? So try to keep that in mind, that whole issue in mind, as you, uh, as you hear this music. Let's listen to a bit of this and do the same kind of comparison to the characteristics that we've done before. It is track 10 on your CD, and you should find the transcription in your book. <laughs> to our characteristics, and which ones can we identify here? Monophonic, absolutely. Mm -hmm. What else? Repetition. Repetition, clearly an element here. Uh -huh. And in fact, not only do we have repetition in the small sense, but that whole thing is repeated three times. What we just heard gets repeated three times, and so uh, and, and what you have in your transcription there. So you have repetition in the large sense as well. Good. What else? Falsetto. Falsetto. Uh huh. There's certainly some of that at the beginning of it. Singing in octaves. Mm -hmm. No. We just have one singer, right? So not going to be possible. What else? Descending small notes. Sure. And you can see that in the transcription as well as hearing it. Okay, what else? Pentatonic scale. Pentatonic scale, <laughs> very good. You, you guys are getting good. You're getting good at this. What else? Percussion. Percussion, accompanied by percussion instruments. Yeah, what do we have here? We have a rattle and we have a particular kind of drum. A water drum. A water drum. Yeah, water drum. And we're going to make one of those in the next session, so stay tuned. Percussion and vocals not necessarily together? Yeah. Absolutely. This is the best example of that principle that you have. We're going to go back and listen to it again. But the vocal and the drums, the drums and the rattles are together, but they are not together with the vocals at all. And they are like they are playing in two different rooms. And they got microphones in two different rooms recording these two people that aren't even listening to each other. That's the, that's the way it's designed. Vocables? Hey, uh, no way, no way, no way. Yeah, these are vocables, right? There's no, uh, there is no literal meaning to this text. Pulsations on long notes? Andy? I was going to ask about the vocables. Yes. Um, you said that they have a lot of personal meaning. Uh, the vocables, yes. So would it change from singer to singer? Uh, not necessarily. I think they would probably keep the, the, the actual vocables the same because it's a tradi traditional kind of song. And the question is, does it have a meaning from, uh, from singer to singer? Uh, in this case, there may be a meaning associated with the peyote church. It's not made clear in our text. Uh, it may be on their, I'm sorry? It says it may um, translate as their homage. 
Ah, okay. So it may translate as their version of Amen. Uh huh. Okay. So there, there is, in fact, uh, some kind of meaning associated with the ritual. Good. Did we, uh, did we determine about pulsations on long notes here? No. Don't hear any? That's the thing. There's really not any long notes in this piece to be able to do that. Let's go back and listen to it again, and I want you to listen specifically to the fact that they are not staying together very well. Other comments and thoughts about this? Yes. It seems like the percussion has this, it, and the vocals have this almost a badly done three on two. Ah, yeah, yeah, almost like a triplet kind of feel. Yeah, it uh -huh. does. Yes, yes. Well, it's interesting you should mention that, three against two, because that's something that is going to become a prevalent feature of African music in our very next chapter. Um, I'm not sure it's deliberate in this case. I think it just happens accidentally. Yes? I was going to say that like the percussion instruments seem to be creating like ambience instead of like a beat. Uh -huh. So like, I, I don't know if that has anything to do with things or just like, they were just like noise in the background that made like certain feeling. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, the, the comment is that it's almost creating an ambient kind of sound instead of a beat, almost like the soundscapes that we studied in our first session, where there is a soundscape behind every place you go, including this room, and we discussed the elements of uh, what makes up the soundscape of this room the last time that we met. So that's, that's definitely a feature here. Uh, okay, we are just ready to uh, uh, wrap up this session very soon. I want to, before we do that, I want to alert you to a couple of assignments that are coming up. Uh, the first one is, first of all, to do the online quiz for Chapter 2. This will be your first online quiz, and we discussed in our first session how to do that, but you go to the website wadsworth.com and then follow the instructions on the syllabus to navigate through until you find the online quiz for this course. Choose the online quiz for chapter two on Native American music and then email the results to my email address in order to get credit for it. Okay, so that is coming up and you'll see the deadline date for that on the syllabus. Another assignment that is going to be coming up soon that I want to alert you to, the assignment is to do the chart for five different songs. The Sioux Grass Dance, the Yebiche, Shizana A, Hymn of the Native American Church, and Folsom Prison Blues and then label the rows and columns, and then just put a yes or a no in each of the boxes that you get on your table. Does that make sense? Okay, so you're not writing a big essay here. You're just confirming the absence or presence of these characteristics. Now let me tell you why this is important, because when we get to the test, some of these pieces are going to be on the test and you're going to have them as listening identifications and as I mentioned in the last session you're going to need to tell me not only the title the culture it comes from but you're going to need to tell me some of the characteristics of this music as well so if you've got this table it'll be an excellent study guide for you for the test because then you can look down and say okay Shazana A it has vocables or not and it has pulsations or not and so you'll be in good shape for the test at that point. We are done for this session. Uh, 
uh, I will see you again at the next session and uh, we will make a water drum at that time. So bring your drum making skills. See you then. <laughs>